Okay, we're going to begin working on Chapter 3 in our book. And one thing you're going to see, uh, the topic here is basically learning how to work with the CSS tools that are available within the .NET environment. Um, one little preface I'm going to give you before we, we dig in. There is a spot in this chapter, and you guys may have already encountered it if you were ambitious and were working ahead, where you're going to discover that some of the tools that they're pointing out don't exist in quite the same way that they used to in the past. Right? But you found them. Yeah. All right. It's just, and, and really, it's a different way to get there is really what it is. But the, the tools are present. So that, that's one thing that we're going to explore in just a few minutes. But I am going to kind of give you a really quick little background on uh, CSS and its history before we start working with it. But CSS is basically an acronym that stands for Cascading Style Sheets. And this is something you should have learned, uh, hopefully in not just one class, but several classes. Um, your first introduction should have been in the Web 1 class, where maybe about a few weeks in, like five, five weeks in or something, you were introduced to this concept. You were probably introduced to the fact that uh, you can do CSS in a number of different ways, but the ideal way is really to create an external document. Um, CSS has become a pretty advanced uh, language in its own right and initially it was built mostly just for styling things. So if you wanted to make something bold or italic or larger or smaller, adjust its position or something like that, you would use CSS. But CSS has kind of graduated to the point where it can do some very sophisticated things now, including doing things where I, I like to put them in the category of behaviors where it looks like it might be JavaScript or some programming language doing it. So in other words, it can make things move and animate and fade in and fade out and um, really some pretty sophisticated things. Not only that, but because of some of the modern CSS3 uh, conventions, you can also do things that are uh, almost programmatic. In other words, things that are contingent upon other things or uh, e even including like variables or things like in injecting content into your pages using CSS. It's not really the, the scope of this class, but it, it's things that you guys should know. So it's really kind of become a pretty sophisticated tool in its own right. Um, and in many cases, uh, kind of replacing uh, what we were doing uh, with JavaScript in, in some capacities, which I think is kind of cool. Um, the author goes through, why do you need it? So he's kind of making the assumption that maybe you haven't uh, really worked with this much in the past, which is fine. And this, the intent here isn't to teach you CSS, but to learn how to use CSS within this environment. Now, I might, uh, by virtue of just helping you guys out with certain things, have you pick up a few CSS tips along the way here, but that's not our scope. Why did they come up with CSS? Well, frankly, in the old days when they came up with HTML, they thought that HTML could do it all. Right? They could find some way to take this, this stateless protocol and convert it into an application platform. It's really not the case. It really needs other technologies to help it. So what we used to do is what you see in this markup right here at the bottom of the page. In fact, when I, when I first started uh, working uh, in HTML and actually like either for work or for you know freelancing, I used the font tag all the time because that's just how you did it back then. You didn't have CSS to work with, and then if you did, it was so conflicting between different browsers and different versions you couldn't count on it, right? So it was just a horrible tool. But we would do this. So we would actually have a font tag, and we would choose our font face and our color, and our size, you know what? Believe it or not, that tag, even though it's deprecated, still works inside all browsers, which is kind of interesting. So if you have legacy code, one way you can identify it real quickly, and when I say legacy, I'm talking uh, last millennium. You know, we're talking like the 90s, really, because this stuff, you know, by the early 2000s, really, for the most part, should have went away. Kind of did everything in mind, but you notice that it was, they were handled as attributes, right? So then it was still up to the browser in how it interpreted the HTML, and of course we had problems with that too. It was a little bit more solid than doing CSS back in the day, but not much 
you know. Um, it, but the thought tag is one that generally worked pretty well. Now, the, the concept here is that because we were working uh, with HTML5 now, the move has been to create something that's more like a real application. And, I, and this is kind of repetitive, and I hope it sticks in your head, but the point of HTML now is really just to hold your stuff, mostly the text and the images, and sometimes not even the images, honestly, and take all the styling out of it and take all the actions out of it. Let your CSS and your JavaScript do those separately. So the font tag does not fit that format because the whole point of the font tag was to style your page. You know, is it such a lofty goal to like make something bold or red or a different font or a different size? It shouldn't be. All right. Now, because you guys already have a background in CSS, my talk about this is going to be uh, a little bit on the kind of quick side. So I'm not here to teach you that technology. I assume you already know the syntax and at least the basic styles, right? So what does the color style do of the text? So that's one of the first CSS tags they came up with, right? Because that was one of the big challenges was how do we get the text to be a different color? Why? So I can make it stand out. So if my product is on sale, I can say sale in red and bold and 72 point type and get people's attention. All right, so we're going to jump right into the try it outs. I still have my project open from working on the last chapter. Uh, I'm actually going to close the pages that I have open um, and then kind of pretend like I'm starting from scratch here. Now, if you don't have your uh, project open, what you'll want to do is go to File, Open, Website, and then navigate to the spot where you got your folder for this class. Now, one thing that I'm doing that is really a big no-no, right, is I left this open from working in Chapter 2, and now I'm starting Chapter 3. So what should I do? Yeah, I, I want to make a copy of this before I begin. So I'm actually going to close my, my solution. Should I save a solution file? I'm going to tell you what, it doesn't matter if you do or you don't. The advantage of saving a solution file is that from there on in, I can open the solution file and it will open the project. But I think if you read what the author says, he probably will tell you no. I'm going to tell you it doesn't really matter, okay, for what we're doing. Uh, where should I put it? Oh, wow, it's putting it in a very weird spot, isn't it? You know what? I'm going to just cancel. I don't even want to contend with it. I'm just going to say no, sayonara. Now, when you go to open up your project, we're going to do the, the file open website. And that just points to a folder. So it doesn't, we don't need the solution file. All right, but I'm going to go to some file management first. So I'm going to go to the folder where my site is located. And I'm just going to give it a right-click copy and a right-click paste. And give it a second to finish up its work. And then I'm going to do a right-click rename. And I'm going to change the name to Chapter to Complete. The work I'm going to begin, I'm not going to work in that folder. I'm just going to work on the regular site folder like I have been. But that really should be your pattern, folks, is whenever you are at the point where you're going to st step away from the machine, I would come in here and do that process. I would right-click, copy, paste, give it a name, and say, this, I got this far, so it's this chapter 3 up to page 52, complete, or something like that, so you know. Why? Because if you screw something up, you don't have to go all the way back to the beginning and recreate everything. Just as really as simple as that. Give yourself a safety net and a point to step back to. Right, I'm going to close that window now, and I'm going to go back, uh, go to open, website, and after you do this a few times, it will always take you back to the same folder so I don't have to navigate for it. So I'm just going to go ahead and say open. It's going to open up my project again. I have peace of mind in the back of my head. I have a safety copy. So if like something happens, I'm good. Even have more peace of mind because this is saving on my Google Drive. So if somebody comes in, grabs my laptop and make, makes a run for it, I still have all my work. No problem. Right? It just files. Everything else, no problem. 
All right, back over to the book, and I'm going to be pulling this off to my second screen here, and I'll be reading from it and letting you know what page I'm on. So we are on the first try it out exercise in chapter three, top of page 68. And first step is they want us to create a new uh, web form inside the demos folder. So we're going to right click the demos folder, and then we're going to add a new web form. This is going to be entitled CSS Demo. I'm going to expand the folder and make sure it was created OK. And what I'm looking for is to make sure that that code behind file is separate. All right. And then uh, they say make sure the page is in markup view. So we're going to switch to the source view. And then locate the title tag. And of course, they want us to add a title. No, they don't want us to add a title. They want us to add a style tag uh, manually. So it says, this is kind of interesting. So they, they said, enter to create an empty line, which I just did, and just start typing the word style and then press tab. Isn't that cool? Yes, a little, little bit of cheating. Um, I'm going to tell you what, that's not, I never do that little trick. That's probably one I should remember. And maybe if I worked in .NET more, you know, like 24-7, I would do that. But I would probably just start typing the style tag. And in which case, if you did that, you know, just like the old-fashioned way, it recognizes that you're doing that. Then you can just press Enter, and it closes it out for you. Same difference, right? As long as you get from one place to the other, and you get it done. One thing you're going to notice uh, in the book, and here's where we start to see version differences, and then keeping in mind that when they wrote this book, they wrote it with Visual Studio 2012. At that time, and I'm, I'm grabbing the book right now, so I don't like give you information that's not exactly true. I'm looking at the title page of the book, and the publish date is 2013, right? So when you look at a book, and the published date is 2013. When was the guy probably writing this? <laughs> yeah, it might have started in 2010. But probably, he probably did a little bit of the work in 2012 even. You know what I mean? So um, it's dated. Was HTML5 a standard at that time? No, it was not. Now, what's interesting is notice in the book that the style tag also has a type attribute, which says text slash CSS, which was required in XHTML. Not required in HTML5. So you can see HTML5 now and Visual Studio 2017 is not including that type text. It's not necessary. Would you break anything if you included it? No, nope, it'll work just fine. Right, the other thing that you want to do here is put your cursor in between create a couple of blank lines, because guess what? We're going to start throwing code in there. All right. So now we're on step three, uh, top of page 69. Uh, and what he wants us to do is type in some styles for H1, paragraph, and a class called Write Aligned. So what I'm going to do is I'm using the PDF version of the book. And I'm just going to paste it in because time is short, right? Notice it didn't paste in real cleanly. So here's where we use our, our trick where we can actually kind of highlight the code like this. Right click, format selection. Perfect. Isn't that great? I love that tool. And so I put it into what it considers um, proper style. A little bit different than what's in the book. You guys notice that in the book, he's got the curly bracket after the selector. I think that's a waste of space. Yeah. Now, the other thing you guys should know about CSS, and I'm hoping you know this already, is you really don't need to have things on a separate line. In fact, I do see a lot of web designers that, when they're experienced, um, sometimes do this. And why? Save space. 
Yeah. And, and you know what, Tom? In a lot of ways, it is cleaner. You know, so how you put the code in does not really matter. Okay. Yeah, you're right. If you had like 20 different styles attached to the H1, you probably don't want to put them all on the same line. It might be a little harder to read. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting, and I don't know if you guys are noticing this, but you notice that the colors have uh, capital letters. Hmm. I'm, you know, I'm not going to answer that question because I'm not really sure if it matters or not. <laughs> like, that's not how I was taught. Um, but apparently, either Microsoft likes it that way or it doesn't matter because otherwise it wouldn't work, right? So right now I'm doing control Z's to get myself back to where I was. Oh, that was one too many. All right, maybe I should format that selection again. Okay, there we go. Oh, really? Yours are not capitalized. So, all right. So, I, you know, I normally I, w I would not do that. You know, isn't that interesting? So, I bring up the the tool, which just happened because I was correcting the G, and notice the styles that it's pulling up. All lowercase. All right. Now, if you guys don't know this about CSS, um, from the very beginning of CSS, they recognized the fact that certain colors you wouldn't have to necessarily type in the hex codes for them to get the colors. That you could just use plain uh, text names for them. They now have plain text names, I think, for, uh, I think it's a minimum of 256 colors. It might even be greater than that now. Yeah. So if you, and, and you can look that up online. Um, so if you know that, like, you know, hot fuchsia is hex code, whatever, you can actually use the plain name. Yeah, I mean, the basic ones. But if, for me, whenever I'm doing stuff and it's something is just like white or black or red, just like straight up colors, I just type it. I just type the name in. There's no reason to, to get really particular. Um, are the colors that we pick important that they're precise? Now, this is one of these things that you guys probably never really studied, but it is true that if you're a Mac person and a PC person, that colors render differently on the two systems. Put them side by side once and you'll see that certain colors look different on a Mac than they do a PC. And a lot of times what we'll see is we'll get a lot of web designers who work exclusively on Macs and then they move their work over to PCs and they're like, what, what is that? That does happen. And it's all about the calibration of your monitor and the way the operating system handles colors. So Macs and PCs do deal with colors differently. For the most part, I tell people you really don't need to worry about it too much unless you're looking for very specific results. So check your monitor, check your color calibration, and if you're a web designer, I strongly recommend that you're a multi-platform person. So if you're doing a lot of front-end design, it's really intelligent to own a Mac and a PC. And test it on both. <laughs> I, well, I, you know, the school sponsors me, Tom, so I get an apple for free, unfortunately. <laughs> but I, I, for a long time, uh, since I've been doing this work, um, and I'm going to say, like, this is like, like good 20 years plus now, I've always owned both platforms. And when I was doing mostly front-end design, frankly, I was doing more of the work on a Mac than I was on a PC. I just like the workflow better, especially when you're using uh, the Adobe products. And, it, and the truth is, yes, you can do both things on both platforms, but it was just one of those things. When you start doing programming code, then I much prefer to work on a PC over a Mac. And when I say programming code, I mean like straight up application development uh, for a lot of different reasons, mostly because of the tools that are available and, and the number of free tools that are available. All right, back on track here, folks. All right, you guys know what these uh, styles mean. Uh, the one thing that's kind of neat, though, that they point out, like, for example, let's say you were manually typing in color, that, you know, don't be afraid to use the built-in tools like this. Because these are, you know, for Microsoft, these are big steps forward. Because 
it wasn't even just a couple versions ago that these tools weren't available where why would a lot of web designers you know choose dreamweaver over visual studio or i mean just for those tools if you guys saw the, the css tools that are available inside of dreamweaver these days they are amazing on a level that really really kind of hard to explain because you can do things graphically code wise drags and drops and, and it's very intelligent and you see exactly what you're doing as you're doing it but these color palettes are a big step forward for microsoft so these are like some of your basic colors and yes you can see that you can kind of scroll through them like this which is kind of neat but you can also hit the down arrow and bring up the system color picking tool which you know that that's so much better you know and then notice that you also have an opacity control and then notice what what happened to the code as soon as they started playing with the opacity control yeah and i'm going to tell you what when it comes to choosing colors and i'm not using plain names i'm a huge fan of either using rgb or rgba as my my color format i pretty much omit hex these days i, I don't see what the point is so that and that's that's just kind of a modern approach the, all the modern editors are pushing everybody to RGBA because that format does it all. So I would encourage you, rather than sit there and try to figure out what a hex code for FF or EA or whatever it is, um, each one of the... Yep, it's, yep that's exactly right, uh, Jason. So the, the first one's red, second one's blue, second one's green. So the stronger the red becomes, you see like the, the values jump up so it's really kind of a neat way to learn it too right so that's that's black all the way along the bottom is black this is white and anything in between you want to switch to different colors it, it's just such a cool tool um, do you need to put opacity on everything absolutely not um, it's just good to know um, now i am actually going to switch this back to to green like the book says because was it green or was it blue it was blue okay because that works for what we need. Question? That's, um, oh, that's a great question. So the question was, why is it RGBA? Why isn't it, you know, red, green, blue, O for opacity? Because when you work in uh, graphics programs, there are certain graphics programs that will refer to opacity as the alpha channel. And that being, the, so that's kind of a carryover from that. That's something that, most coders don't know because they've never worked in graphics programs. They, like, they've probably never touched Photoshop. But, it, yeah, it's alpha. That's what it stands for. Kind of interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Should be RGBO. Let's make a move so that in CSS4, <laughs> let's sign a petition. All right, so they want us to now uh, scroll down here and they want us to add some code in between the div tags. I am once again going to just copy paste because I am essentially a lazy typist. Plus, I don't want to make mistakes. And then I'm just going to highlight my code, right click, format selection to clean it up. And then you can see they created a H1 tag, a couple of paragraphs. And then uh, they created a class attribute for the second paragraph called right aligned, which of course is going to match up with our style above. Now, one thing that I think that's really kind of neat here, and this is really what I would call a good practice, right, is notice that all that the right aligned class does is set text alignment to right. And the name that he chose for it is an intelligent name, right? Keeping in mind that with classes on HTML attributes, you can apply multiple classes to a class designation. So I could create one that just said, make it blue, right? And right aligned. And I can just keep adding those classes and I know exactly what they're going to do. And after you get a standard way of working it, and I'm going to tell you what, when you get into professional workflow, I, I had like, like a whole list of them that I would always use. One of them, I, I called mine just red or uh, just blue or right aligned or centered or, you know, whatever it happened to be. And then I would just pick those styles up and move them to every project. And then I would just very quickly, and people were like, how did you do that so fast? It's like, well, I have my standard library of CSS things that I've pre-created. I move them to every project. I know what they're called. I bring them in in a hurry. Boom, I'm done. Right? 
So I'm just trying to give you little ideas for like how you can make your life easier. No, yeah, you just uh, space separate it. So if I had one that was called uh, just red or, you know, centered or whatever it was, I, you just type them in, space separated, and it pulls in that class. So that's the important thing to know, and a lot of people, especially when they're starting out, they don't know that you can apply more than one class to an object. You can only apply one ID, though. What's the hierarchy for... Oh, I see. Excellent, excellent question. So the question is, what's the hierarchy? So if I like put in class statements that had conflicting components, right? I mean, one I said red, and then the next one I said blue. Whatever was called last happens. Yeah, there. Lots of lots of. Yeah, you can use lots of little CSS3 tricks to force hierarchies, um, but generally speaking, CSS reads top down. So like, even if you created a style sheet and you accidentally put one style in at the top of the style sheet and one at the bottom, the one at the bottom, whatever red was parsed last, will, will override and happen first. All right, well, now that we've gone through and added some styles, uh, the author says in step number five, figure 3-2, uh, to go into split screen mode and try to kind of look at the two things at the same time. So you can look at your styles, and you can see how they're applied in the markup, and then you can see what the output is. And you can see the design view with something real primitive like this does show you what it looks like. So the H1 is green, the first paragraph is blue, in fact all the paragraphs are blue because it applies to both paragraph tags, and you can see that the second paragraph is right aligned. Right? You want to bring it up in your browser, you know, bring it up in your browser so you can grab that screenshot for me. Just like that. You want to get an efficient screenshot? I'm trying to give you guys some tips, right? So you don't have to grab a screenshot that's like 1,600 pixels wide or, or whatever your resolution is. Um, you can narrow up your browser. And then I, I would do something like this. I'd just bring up the snipping tool and click New. And in fact, I wouldn't be quite so eager to do it like that. I might even try to be even more efficient. You guys can see how I might do my screenshots. Let's close all these little dialogues, right? And maybe just go to source code view, get that whole source code and in into view, bring the browser up, put it on the right side of the screen. So I, I get people that are pretty efficient with their screenshots. So like, this is what I would do. I would take one screenshot that basically captured all of it like that. Boom, done. Because right now, that's kind of like one of the ways I look at your work, right? So you, up, you, you, you guys are grabbing screenshots, and then you're also zipping your code and uploading that. All right. But a, a, an efficient screenshot like this shows me the code and the output all at the same time. If you're not that efficient, I might frown, frown upon you silently. No, actually, I wouldn't do that at all. Uh, everybody works in their own way. But what I, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to discourage people from doing is because a lot of people, when they do screenshots, they only know about the print screen button. Yeah. The, the snipping tool is good. If you're on a Mac, you can use the grab tool, but you wouldn't be doing this on a Mac anyhow. Um, but, you, but certainly you could take efficient screenshots either way. Um, and another, you know, efficient thing to do 
is if you hold on your control key and then use your mouse scroll button, you can make your stuff bigger and smaller like this. Um, and when you have a screenshot, I really don't care to see the menus and the solution explorer. I really just need to see the code. And if you're not showing me the code and then you're not showing me like your browser output and I'm trying to grade it, then I, then I get forced to, I have to open up the project and run it to see, to make sure that it's working okay. Yeah, if you guys uploaded this to Apollo, what would happen? It wouldn't work it's because Apollo's not running .NET component. I do want the zip file. Okay, well, let me just clarify. Whatever I say in the assignment description is what you should do. So for some of them, yeah, just screenshots at this point. Yeah. Now, the, but again, I'm going to give you one disclaimer. The one reason why you might want to include your code is so that there's a backup copy. Very good, Tom. <laughs> Just so you know, Tom said that he's got his on his Google Drive, so... All right, last thing I'm going to do here, folks, uh, before we wrap for the night, is I'm going to go ahead and hit the play button and just make sure it comes up in the browser okay. No, no, mine's doing it. Okay, great. <laughs> but why is mine doing it? Oh, but what page am I trying to launch? Yeah. So I'm going to launch the page I just created, and there it is. Okay. So... We were successful in our tasks so far. So we finished here up through uh, page 70. So when we reconvene uh, next week, we're going to pick up right here. Um, this chapter does have a lot of exercises. And as we were talking uh, earlier, um, some of the things are in different places and are a little more, bit more challenging to find compared to what the instructions in the book are. I do detail how to find those things in last year's video. So the ones recorded in... 2017 if you guys have access to the course show you can go there and find them if you want to keep working ahead um, I also just posted unit 3 uh, which will allow you to work on chapter 4 if you're at that point proceed methodically and with patience um, because there's lots of steps and lots of stuff to learn in these chapters even though it what we're doing is somewhat rudimentary it's still very important stuff to the environment and, um, have a great week we'll see you next time